This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, and it's page 913 in your church Bibles. So that's Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself parts of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, did it not remain Oh, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who had heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they, sh they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who had heard of these things. So Joshua chapter 7, page 182. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. The men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not make all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they're few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, O lass, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that be, we've been content to dwell beyond the Jordan? O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things that have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. 
Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand to their enemies. They turn their backs to their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst of Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered the Lord, sorry, answered Joshua, truly I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel, and they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Well, that's the passage that we're going to look at today. And I don't know what your kind of immediate reaction to that is, it, but I guess it's kind of a, oh, gosh. So we're going to think about what that passage is here for, what it's teaching us, what the Lord is saying to us today. And I want to start by asking you this question. I want to ask you whether you have boiled your wooden spoons and your answer to that question reveals how much you are part of the TikTok generation. Uh, because it is the latest craze, there is a woman who boils her wooden spoons in order to clean them, and the dirt comes out, and uh, an unbelievable 49 million people have watched her TikTok video of her boiling her wooden spoons. Uh, it's worth saying other cleaning methods are available. <laughs> Uh, you may want to boil out all the food residue and the oil and the grease that is in there. Uh, others think, uh, well, that's just disgusting. Why would you want to carry on using them when so much grime is in them? Um, better just to throw them away. I mean, you can buy another wooden spoon for £1.50 in Ikea. Uh, why bother? Our question today is how God feels about our dirtiness our sin. Does God hate sin? Does he want to boil it up to clean it? Does he want to throw it away? How much does God hate sin? How angry 
does sin make God? And I'm talking not just about sin out there, but sin in here. What God does about it in the Bible, and in this book of Joshua in particular, can be seen in what you might call the unacceptable face of conquest. Now, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you'll know that the story so far is that God is giving the land, a particular land, to his people. And he's promised this land is going to be theirs. And the whole book is about God's people getting the place that God had promised to them. But of course, that is going to mean that the people in that place have got to be driven out. So the chapter immediately before this, chapter six, is the story of Jericho and the destruction of that city. So it just kind of falls flat. Sinners, if you like, who are in the land have got to be cleaned out. And that sounds imperialistic. Sounds like 19th century colonialism. Sounds like ethnic cleansing. And God sanctions it. God commands it. God seems to get cross when they don't do it. And the thing that is vital for us to get a handle on today, behind all this, is this simple fact that God hates sin. I mean, he really, really hates sin. And there are two things that show this. The first thing is that he destroys his enemies. And the phrase that is used in this passage, it came up a number of times, is the phrase devoted to destruction or devoted things. That God is bringing his destroying judgment onto his enemies. I put up there a reference uh, somewhere else in the Bible, 400 years earlier in Genesis chapter 15. And that is where the promise was first made to Abraham that God is going to give his people this bit of land. Now, Abraham was already in the land that God was promising when God made the promises. He said, I'm going to give you this land, but not yet, said God. It's going to come back to you in 400 years time. And in the meantime, you're going to go to Egypt. You're going to get enslaved there by Pharaoh. And of course, Moses is going to have to bring the people out through the desert to get to this story in Joshua. And the reason it's going to be delayed for 400 years is because of a strange little phrase that comes in Genesis 15. But it's going to be delayed for 400 years because the iniquity of the Amorites, that is the sin of the inhabitants here in Canaan, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's a strange idea. And I think it's basically saying there is more sin to come yet. It's not yet time, 400 years ago, for God's judgment to fall. But there will come a point in 400 years' time, and it needs to happen. It speaks of God's delay, God's patience. He's going to wait until the sin of the Amorites becomes, well, actually proverbial, became so bad that they were renowned for being into idolatry and child sacrifice and terrible sexual perversion. 400 years would pass until it reached that point. You know the game of Jenga? You know, where you build up three blocks of wood on top of each other all the way up, and then you have to slowly remove odd block of wood from one another. I never know when I use stories like this and nobody responds, whether I'm thinking, nobody has ever heard of Jenga. Would you just give me a little polite nod if you've ever heard of Jenga? Okay, fine, great. (laughs) That's reassuring, okay? Don't have to go through the entire rules of the game. But you you know how it happens, that the game always ends the same way. It always ends with the tower collapsing. The only question is how long it will take until that happens. It's going to end with the whole thing crashing down once the instability is complete. And that's kind of the picture here, that the Amorite sin is going to build up and build up. The nation is become, going to become less and less stable. Their sin is worse until God's judgment comes and pulls the whole thing down. Look at our own nation. What has the last 400 years done to sin in our nation? Think about the 17th century and the 18th and the 19th and the 20th. All the way through that period, did we get better? On the whole, is the 20th century far better than it used to be, or did we get worse? Sin seems to get worse, doesn't it? That's our experience. It's not that the world is getting better. It was at the beginning of the 
20th century great optimism that things were getting better. And you may know the story written by William Golding called The Lord of the Flies, which tells the story of a group of boys marooned on an island who get left to their own devices, have to create their own civilization, and it goes horribly wrong. And the man who wrote that story, William Golding, uh, described in an essay that he wrote called Fable, you can read it online, he described in Fable why he wrote the story, and it was because the horrors of the 20th century revealed to him how awful sin is. He lost his confidence, his optimism in humankind that things were getting better, and he said, no, it's getting worse. And the Amorite sin was going to get worse and worse and worse until, like a Tower of Jenga, it was going to come down. God delays, but he will bring final judgment. But the second reason why Israel must clear the land is because uh, God protects his people. And the whole process, if you like, is a bit like disinfecting the land. And here again, I put it up another verse from the Bible, from Deuteronomy chapter 20, where God is saying, when you come into the land, you must clear the sinful nations away that, and here is the reason, that they may not teach you to do all of their abominable practices, the stuff that they do for their gods, so that you end up sinning against the Lord your God. If you keep them, you will learn from them, you will copy them, and you will become like them. And of course, we all want to fit in, don't we? None of us want to stand out. It is hard as a Christian, isn't it, to swim against the tide? And God knows this. And so he says to these people, get rid of that invasive influence among you. Don't tolerate it, but clear it away. Two of my daughters were in a flat share in Mile End, and they got bed bugs in their flat. Well, you may be thinking, of course, that's north of the river, right? North of the river, disgusting, <laughs> whoever goes there. Anyway, they got bed bugs in their flat, and the result of it was everything that they owned had to be put through a boil wash or burnt, destroyed. You can't just kind of clean it up. It's it got to have drastic, drastic measures have got to be taken uh, to get rid of the nasty little bed bugs. The rash that they had on their skin or whatever, that was the first sign. But it was far deeper than that. All needed to be clear away. And sin is deadly. It produces not just a rash, but it is fatal. You don't have to eat rat poison to know how poisonous it is. If you see your toddler <laughs> finding the poison you put down in your house and stuffing it into their mouth, you grab hold of them and pull it out of their mouth, don't you? And that's what God does here. He protects his people from that poisonous influence. How seriously does God take sin? Well, so seriously that he brings judgment against it, slowly, patiently, but inevitably to, to bring down his enemies. And he takes it so seriously that he protects his people lest we go the same way. So just to be clear, before we get into looking at our passage, Israel's warfare, Israel's conquest in the land, all this, if you like, devoting to destruction, it's theological. It's disinfecting. God is on the move to bring judgment on those who oppose him and to protect his people. In, in our Western world today, tolerance is held up, isn't it, as the Christian virtue. So before we get into looking at our passage, it's worth just being clear, isn't it, that God isn't all tolerant. There are some things he is not tolerant about. And sin is one of those things. He has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to sin. And that is both sin out there, which is what chapter six is all about. Sin in Jericho, bringing down that city to protect his people, but also sin in here, which is what chapter seven is about. What we're going to see in chapter 7 is just how much God hates sin. Now, as I came to this story, I thought the main point of this story was it is basically a slow revelation of somebody's hidden sin. So you've got Achan done something he shouldn't does done, and it is slowly revealed that he's nicked something. 
I think I've said uh, before about uh, my father, he used to be a children's evangelist, and he had a really good talk that he used to do on this passage. And it basically was, be sure your sin will find you out. That's a little verse that comes elsewhere in the Bible. It comes Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. Those of you who like numbers will notice there's a palindrome, 32, 23. There's some people that appeals to, right? Anybody, anybody appeals to that? Anybody know Jenga? Anybody like maths? Okay, right. Um, so be sure your sin will find you out. That was my dad's talk on this passage. It's a very powerful talk. You can imagine to children, you know, the wrong, wrong things that you do and you think are hidden, they will come out in the end. But I don't think, if you look down to chapter 7, that's not quite how the story is told because verse 1, we get a massive plot spoiler. We know the cause right in the beginning of verse 1. We know the culprit. We're told in verse 1, it's Achan. There's no who done it through this chapter. Not for us as readers. And actually, the focus of the chapter is not so much on Achan and his sin as it is on God and his anger. How seriously does God take sin? It makes him really angry. Look how the chapter begins, verse 1, end of verse 1. The anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And that is resolved in the very last verse of the chapter. Look to verse 26. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Those are, the, if you like, the bookends at the beginning and end of the story. God has burning anger in the face of sin. God is incensed at sin. And that is the issue of the chapter, that God hates sin, has this zero tolerance approach to sin. He's burning with anger at sin. And the big question here is, what can be done about God when he is angry at sin? Well, let's follow the story through. First of all, then, uh, the first little bit of the passage, uh, we see in the first verses that Israel cannot stand before her enemies because she has taken some of these devoted things. Uh, that's what the second half of verse uh, one says, that this man, Achai, Achan, here's the plot spoiler, has taken some of the devoted things. All of Jericho back in chapter six has been devoted to destruction. That means it's to be flattened, destroyed as judgment and as protection. The astounding victory that God did was the whole city being flattened and burnt. And look how chapter 7 begins, the very first word of the chapter. This chapter has a big but, as the Americans would say. You can snigger politely at that. That's a joke for the Americans. Here's the next city in the land that God has promised. Here is the next step for Joshua to take. This is the next advance as the Lord is with him, but... Ai is a small city. It only needs a meager army to um, to deal with it. You know, just three thousand ants will be fine. Look down to verse four. About three thousand men went up there from the people, and they ended up running away from the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed them, about thirty-six of them, and chased them for a long way. And the end of, the, of that verse, verse 5, is the hearts of the people, that's the people of Israel, God's people, their hearts melted and became as water. Isn't that a descriptive thing? In other words, they were absolutely, oh my goodness, what's happening to us? And if you've been here the last few weeks, you may recognize that little phrase about hearts melting. Because that is what the people of the land have done when they heard Israel were coming. Their hearts melted with fear. We've heard what God has done. Uh-oh, they're on the march towards us. Again and again through the book, the hearts of the Canaanites melt. But here, the hearts of Israel melt. It's, it's almost like the conquerors have become conquered. What? What is going on in verses 4 and 5? And we know the reason why. Verse 1 tells us, Achan had stolen some of the devoted things and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Second half of verse 13, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. So here is Israel before her enemies 
and she cannot stand. Then in the next little scene, verses 6 to 9, Joshua falls before the Lord. Verse 6, he tore his clothes. He fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. He and the elders of Israel got dust on their heads. And they, Joshua said, oh, lasso, Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us when our job was to come and destroy them? Would that we'd been content to stay the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say when Israel has run away from their enemies? And the question right at the end of verse 9, what will you do for your great name? You might expect Joshua to end his prayer by saying, what are you going to do for us? And Joshua ends by saying, what are you going to do about you? Because if our name is cut off, then your name is in the mud as well. People will say, we've heard what God did in Egypt, but he couldn't carry it on into Canaan. Yahweh is a bit of a one-hit wonder, isn't he? That's what they'll say. So Joshua is right to be concerned for the reputation of his warrior Lord. And so verse 10, the Lord speaks. I don't think there are many times in the Bible where somebody is told to stop praying. But you see, that, that's what God says in verse 10. Look down to this. Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? There's no use lying there groveling, Joshua. Get up. Sort the problem. What is the problem? Verse 11, Israel have sinned. What Achan has done, we discover, is not just his personal sin, but it affects all the people. Israel have sinned. That's why, verse 12, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. That's what the Lord speaks to tell Joshua. There is a simple explanation here of what's going on, and that is Israel's sin. Verse 11, they've transgressed my covenant. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen and they've lied and they've made their devoted things their own. They brought that stuff that was earmarked for destruction in here so that in here is now devoted for destruction. Israel, you are now marked out. Look at verse 12. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand to their enemies. They turn their backs to their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I'll be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. We've been watching uh, Jeremy Clarkson's uh, farm program on Prime. I don't know if you've been watching it. Some people, Jeremy Clarkson's like Marmite, isn't he? You either love him or hate him don't really like him. But anyway, one of the things he's doing in his farm is trying to keep cows. And you know, that's the origin of the phrase earmarked. Did you know that? That when we say something's earmarked, that comes from cows, that you cut a little bit in their ear as a way of saying, this is for mine, this is mine, or this is for that, my, that particular purpose. It's earmarked for that. And what this verse is saying is that Israel herself is now earmarked, marked out, this is to be destroyed. And then we come to the very center of the story, the devastating midpoint of the story. We've got these bookends of God's anger and the calamity right at the very heart. Look down to verse 12. God says, I will be with you no more. That is, in the task that God gave Israel to take the land, claiming God's promise. I said, I would go with you, Joshua. Every, every place you're, the sole of your foot trod, I would be with you, enabling you, giving you victory. I will be with you in that. I will be your commanding officer to lead the army. army. I will be your warrior lord to conquer the land. But now, no more. Look how the previous chapter ended. Chapter 6, verse 27, so the Lord was with Joshua. But now, chapter 7, verse 12, not so much. And the Lord speaks again. First of all, when he spoke, he spoke to about the problem, that the problem was sin. And now he speaks about the solution, 
and the solution is fire. Look down to verse 13. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, you shall be brought near by your tribes and the tribe the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by household. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he's done an outrageous thing in Israel. Here is God's solution to the problem he diagnosed. This is how much God hates sin. Do you see that word towards the end of that verse? Sin is outrageous. It is disgraceful. It is scandalous. I'm not really sure that we feel the shame of our sin often, that it is an outrage. It is destined for the fire. There's no other place suitable for it. We tend to think that our sin is sort of destined for the washing machine cycle, maybe a really hot cycle, but it just really needs a clean. No, the Lord says it must be burnt to destroy the wrong and to purify you. The Lord destroys his enemy and protects his people. Then verses 16 to 23, we come back before the Lord again and Previously in verse 9, do you remember Joshua had said to the Lord, what will you do? And this section now leads up to the question in verse 19, where Joshua says to Achan, tell me what you have done. And we go through a process. The Lord takes a tribe and then a clan and then a man and then a household. Actually, that word takes, like the Lord takes the next kind of bit if you like, in the Russian dolls going towards the center. That word takes is actually the word captures. That the Lord is kind of seizing, he's grabbing hold of the culprit, focusing down closer and closer until the spotlight comes on just one man. He's, he's slowly zooming in, notch by notch, frame by frame, step by shameful step. Here's my question. What was Achan thinking when this process was going on? Why didn't he step forward and admit it? Now he can see this searchlight, this spotlight zooming in. He knows where it's going to stop. He's given so many chances to just sort of put his hand up and say, it's me. So many opportunities to just say, look, this is what I did. Again and again, God gives him a chance. What have you done? Verse 19, tell me, don't hide it. And Achan's reply in verse 20 and 21 is basically he says, I've done an Adam and Eve. I have done exactly what Eve did. Look at verse 21. He says, I saw these things. I coveted them and I took them. I saw, I coveted, I took Remember the story of Eve in Genesis chapter 3? It's exactly the same. She saw the tree was good. She desired the tree and its fruit. She took the fruit and ate. And that is the archetypal steps to sin. This chapter is a classic fall story, if you like. This is an everyman's story. It's our own Adam and Eve story that we, we see, we want, we take. Somebody said, I saw this week on Twitter, 100% of men would eat any fruit that was given to them by a naked woman. The story of the Bible is that 100% of people like seeing and wanting and taking if we think we can get away with it. But we cannot because sooner or later it must all come before the Lord. And that's what happens to Achan. He stands before the Lord and then discovers he cannot stand before the Lord because he himself has become devoted to destruction. It's a horrible 
end to the story, to this outrageous event. These devoted things have got to be taken from among Israel. What has been declared condemned has now got to be brought down. What is to be destroyed must be destroyed. God must judge. God must condemn. And he does. Look down to verse 24. They brought him, them, up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned them with stones. They burned them with fire. They stoned them with stones. They raised over them a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And the Lord turned from his burning anger. And therefore, to this day, the place is called the Valley of Achor. See how the story ends, verse 26. The Lord turned from his burning anger. We're rightly squeamish about the horror of what happens to this family. So verse 26 doesn't seem like good news. It sort of falls flat for us. But of course, this chapter is not so much about our sin. It's more about God's anger at our sin. Verse 1 is the problem. The anger of the Lord burned. Verse 26 is the problem resolved. And actually the story does end very well. It may not seem that this is not a happy story for a sunny day. But I think there are four things for us, crucial things, that we can learn from this story for us today. Here's the first one. Take sin seriously. God does, and so should we. We need his zero-tolerance approach and some aggressive policing. Aggressive policing of things like what we look at, where we go, what we do. We need to cut off our hand, cut off our feet, pluck out our eye. That's what we've been seeing in our grace groups midweek, hasn't it? Only a couple of weeks ago. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with one hand or one foot or one eye than play with poison and risk God's destructive judgment. See, sin is not just out there. It's, you know, there's so much wrong with the world. Sin is in here. There's so much wrong with me. Some years ago, when I was minister of another church, one of the small group Bible study leaders phoned me and urgently wanted to see me that day. So I knew something was up. And he came around to see me and said that he had inherited a huge sum of money and the previous night he'd been out celebrating. And he'd spent some of that money in stupid, sin-indulging ways. And he came to see me the very next day to, to lay it all out before me to, in confession, to confess his sin before me. It was, it was humbling for him. It was embarrassing. It was humiliating for him. But he was deadly serious about his sin. And the line he said has always stuck with me. He said, I don't want my money to take me to hell. How different he was to this lying and self-deceiving Achan, hoping the sin will go away, hoping his sin won't be found out. Take sin seriously, zero tolerance, aggressive policing. It's not a big deal to tell a fellow Christian that we're a sinner. It is a very big deal to pretend to God that we're not. Second thing, take God's anger seriously. I, I don't treat this story lightly. God's judgment on sin is uncompromising, isn't it? No wonder atheists find this kind of God capricious, mean-minded, stupid, bloodthirsty massacres, xenophobic relish. Some years ago, I was preaching through Joshua in the church, and one of the men in the church left the church over the book of Joshua. Not like bad preaching, but over the message of Joshua. He said to me, I don't want a God like that. And he went to another church that would tell him some different things. And maybe as a you're here today, not as a Christian or a skeptic, you're looking in and you're thinking exactly that. I don't want 
a God like that. But let me put this to you, to stay away from Christianity because part of the Bible is offensive, assumes that if there is a God, that he wouldn't have anything about him that might upset you, any views that might upset you. Of course he might. Who God is, that's far more significant than who I want God to be. He is good always, even in Joshua chapter 7. It is very good that he wants to protect his people from sin and from the hell to which sin leads. He is good. It's a very good thing that he judges. It shows he cares. He really does care about what people do. It, it's good that just as in this story, there will come a day when all that is wrong will be exposed and brought into the light and evil people won't get away with it. Evil will not win. This is good news. His anger helps us to see that not just how much he utterly detests and abhors sin for the outrageous thing it is, but it is just so outrageous. That's what we see here. It, it's We tend to think of sin as naughty but nice. It's an outrageous thing. It makes God very angry. When I was at school, I wasn't especially good at sport, particularly summer sports. And I spent lots of Wednesday afternoons lying, watching cricket. Um, when you've got a whole Wednesday afternoon to while away, what are you going to do lying in the grass? Well, magnifying glasses. Great thing. You can set fire to Latin textbooks. You can play chicken on the back of your hand. You can fry beetles. I mean, there's so much you can do with a magnifying glass. All the rays of the sun focus to one point. I've heard this used to describe what happens at the cross of the Lord Jesus. That God's right anger at sin. All the, the horrors of Ukraine the abuse of a paedophile, God's anger at the Holocaust, at the people traffickers, at my outrageous sin, that all of that is focused down, down, down to a point of terrifying intensity as God's anger at all of those things is burnt into the head of the Lord Jesus. What can be done about God's anger, well, all that is destined for destruction must be destroyed. And at the death of my beloved Savior, at the death of God's beloved Son, it was. The Lord turned from his burning anger. So take God's anger seriously. It's the most small thing. Third thing, give glory to God. I passed over this phrase, but look down to verse 19 where Achan is brought forward and it's revealed that he has done wrong. And Joshua says, verse 19, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. I'm not quite sure what he's supposed to do. How do I give glory to God? I'm not quite sure what he's being asked to do. I mean, it's definitely not by doing an Adam and Eve. Actually tell what you've done, admit it. That's what he's told to do. But I wonder if there's a bigger thing as well, that sin begins, doesn't it, with doubting God, doubting his word, his goodness, his truthfulness. So I wonder if you give glory to God by filling your heart, your mind, your will, your mouth with him, his goodness, his provision, his sufficiency. Sin always wants more. Sees, wants, desires, takes. Whereas godliness is content, as Psalm 73 puts it, there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Give glory to God. And here's the final thing, trouble and hope. You see where the story ends? The, the valley gets called trouble. I know it's said acor, but if you look down to the bottom, you'll see that acor means trouble. So they bring him to the valley of trouble. And verse 25, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today, verse 26. Therefore, the name of that place is called the valley of trouble. Here's the thing. This valley makes another appearance in the Bible. It's in the book of Hosea. And it's a book that tells how God is heartbroken at his people's sin. Not just outraged, 
but he's utterly gutted at it. He hits him in the stomach when we sin against him. And amidst the tragedy in that book of Hosea, the same sort of judgment and sin that this chapter is talking about, in the middle of it, God points to a possible future restoration for his sinful people. And he says, I, I will allure my people. I will speak tenderly to my people again. I will draw my people back and I will make the valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, a valley of hope. It's a lovely picture, a moving PS to this story of Achan. What does God think about our sin? Does he hate it? How much does he hate it? He hates it very very much. The outrage volume is turned up to Joshua 7 level in this story. And beyond trouble, beyond judgment, there is hope even for a sinner like me. I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. God's anger burnt into Jesus so that I can know hope rather than trouble. A new start beyond the death of Jesus. Destruction falls on him that I might walk into a different kind of valley. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you that only you are holy. My God is a holy God. And we praise you for this unique characteristic of you. And we thank you then in your kindness and your goodness. You've shown us what you think of our sin, how outrageous it is, how deserving of destruction it is. And we pray that the sobering details of this story may help us this week to have a right attitude to sin, to take it seriously, to have a right attitude to your anger, and to see that at the death of the Lord Jesus, our sin and your anger is dealt with. Thank you that the valley of trouble can become a door of hope for us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we are sobered up by the details of this story at the same time as we are praising you for your uniqueness and your utter holiness and your right jealousy, we would also be utterly astounded by your kindness and generosity to deal with our sin and to deal with your anger in the Lord Jesus. And we praise you for that in his name. Amen.